Welcome. Good morning, Wild Things. Uh, my name is Trevor Edmondson, and today I'll be talking with you about my hobby of sheet lighting for insects. It's good to be here with you on this winter morning as we come off a, a heck of a week of uh, snowfall in the area. Uh, I hope you have something warm to drink and a hunger for a new adventure, and like me, are maybe dreaming about uh, doing some sheet lighting this summer. So, a little about me. Uh, a year ago, I started working for the Nature Conservancy in Indiana as the site manager at Kinky Sands, which has been great for my hobby of sheet lighting because my boss uh, is an entomologist. And so it's nice to have him um, you know, encouraging me and uh, let me explore this. Um, I also serve on the board for my local park district uh, in, in Kankakee County. Um, I write an off-the-trail column for the Daily Journal in Kankakee, where you can off often find me talking about strange insects that I find at night. I am a proud husband of uh, Colleen, a teacher in Bourbonnet, and father to William, a strong-willed three-year-old. Um, I am not a professionally trained entomologist, but I find the study really fascinating, and I hope to keep learning uh, where and when I can. This presentation reflects my experiences with sheet lighting dating back to 2018. Uh, when I first tried it. I also happen to love macro photography, and often you can find me day or night in nature with my camera. Sheet lighting and macro photography are great companion hobbies. Every single insect photo in this presentation are those that I, I have taken virtually with this combination here. I do have a different type of flash sometimes I use. So um, when you leave here today, I hope you know what equipment you will need to get started with sheet lighting. I also hope that you can begin to see what magic nature has been hiding from you after dark and that you'll want to explore more on your own, whether that be at home or the lands that you may steward. I first read this, um, this quote from John Himmelman's book, Discovering Moths, as I was beginning my sheet light lighting journey, and I could not agree more. When darkness sets in, we retreat to our well-lit homes to wait it out. It has been my experience that once a person discovers just a smattering of what can be found in the darkness, the setting sun becomes a prelude to an exciting part of the daily cycle, a prelude to discovery. Welcome to the night. I highly recommend John Himmelman's book, Discovering Moths, uh, and all his nature-based children's books, uh, which I've bought a few for my son. This book in particular that I'm quoting here was published in 2002, and John still does sheet lighting uh, at his home in Connecticut. His words and experiences uh, reflected in that book were influential into why I'm presenting here today. So what is sheet lighting? Well, sheet lighting is incredibly simple. Uh, you have a sheet and a light that you turn on at night. Insects are attracted to that said light, and they fly to it. They tend to get confused once they get pretty close to the light, um, and hopefully they land on your sheet as a near as a result of that. Um, as they rest there, you can then photograph, document, and just gaze at them in wonder. New species are constantly flying in, so it can be quite exciting. Um, on and on exceptional nights, hard to actually keep up with at times. I first encountered sheet lighting during a bio blitz with the wetlands initiative um, when I was working for them at the Dixon waterfowl refuge. I was assigned as a staff person to attend a portion of the event and help document some of the species. That's where I met Frank Hitchell. Fr Frank is from the Peoria Academy of Sciences. I still remember being struck by Frank's enthusiasm and knowledge of seemingly everything. All I saw was a sheet with thousands of insects and it was really overwhelming that first night, as you can see, looking at his sheet in this picture. I couldn't believe that someone could recall thousands of insects um, in scientific and common names, and so many species that seem to be very hard to distinguish from one another. He told me later that once you recognize a few of the common and abundant insects, your brain can sort of block out the noise, uh, which allows you to focus on just the new things that are flying in. Uh, and as they, as they did, he would jot them down on his notepad that he's got there in his hand. Um, yeah, Frank Frank uh, was a big, I still talk to him on the phone. He's still doing, um, he has a nice catalog of his moths uh, on the Peoria Academy of Sciences website. Uh, most of them, like I said, are from Peoria County. 
Um, another thing that, that inspired me about Frank was that he was also not a trained entomologist. He started sheet lining and collecting insects for his daughter's high school project, but she graduated and he kept going. Frank has been documenting moths and insects in and around Peoria County for a couple decades now. And uh, like I said, he's got, oh, he's got a lot of species. Uh, since meeting Frank and setting, getting my setup going, I've done sheet lighting in my backyard, the Kanky River State Park, the Morton Arboretum, the Dixon Waterfowl Refuge, Indian Ridge Marsh in Chicago, Kanky Sands, and various other places where friends and family have trusted me to be outside uh, in their yard at night. When I started, I didn't have access to all that top of the line stuff that Frank did, nor did I even know actually where to look for it. Um, the night after I returned home from the bio blitz, I was hooked. I went to my garage and found a clamp lamp and it's a, st a step ladder. I went to the linen closet, found a white, old white sheet in the bathroom. I stole a light bulb from above the mirror. I was determined to make this happen. My wife probably wasn't too thrilled with me setting up a large sheet as this one exactly this setup in, my, in our front yard at night with everyone driving by. I think she thought that people would think we were having a photography session for some reason. Um, but yeah, this is this is what my first setup looked like. Um, it was exhilarating to wait and find out what showed up. What creatures have I been missing out in my yard, missing uh, from my yard while I sleep? After watching Frank, I knew the answer was a lot. Having a one-year-old at the time, sheet lighting was a perfect hobby for me. And as I was only free when he went to bed at night or when, and he was and still is a pretty good sleeper. I can't wait for him to be able to stay up with me into the night, watching and waiting for new things to fly in. You certainly can start with just a fluorescent bulb from the bathroom like I did, or an LED if you have one. However, not all bulbs are created equal. Some bulbs provide different wavelengths of non-visible UV light that insects are confounded by. I recently went to a hardware store and also to a large grocery store chain to find some examples that would be perfect for most people starting out. Um, you can also find black light UV bulbs on Amazon or your local party store. And these are some local prices in the Kanki area. You know, a black light uh, from Lowe's there, I think, $379. Um, the LED black light is $8. That was at Meyer, I believe. Um, BioQuip uh, is an in entomological online supply store. They have a nice 20 watt UV bulb that can, um, so it's a little bit higher. Um, and uh, it's it puts out a, a good amount of light um, and they sell it there. Um, my goal here though, is to really to get you started. And once you get started, I feel like you'll get hooked and you'll wanna look in some of those more advanced options. I do use a black light, but often my main light is, is now a mercury vapor bulb. This bulb is brighter and puts out a wider spectrum than the black light. It is great for sheet lighting if you can find them. However, that can be a challenge. You need to find a self-ballasted bulb, unless you have a special ballast box that you can wire up just for this purpose. Frank does <laughs> in his backyard in Peoria. He's got a, uh, some sort of uh, receptacle that he's mounted on a post just for sheet lighting. So he, he has that ballast box. Um, you need to find that self-ballasted um, bulb, like the one I have here, which is self-ballasted. It's sort of got the, the ballast part within the light bulb itself, and so it can plug into a um, more of a traditional uh, light socket. Um, in natural areas, this light is great because it casts a really uh, bright light and can pull insects in for a long, from a long ways, if that's your goal. Um, but however, in urban areas like my backyard, I'm cautious, very cautious of its placement for fear of disturbing my neighbors. It is very bright. For your project or your goals, you may not need, need such a, a bright bulb. I like to have uh, bulb, different bulbs for different uh, options. As far as the base of the bulb, almost anything will work as long as you can take it outside and either hang it up or, and, or stand it up on something. Here are two options I still use often. Both can be found at any hardware store for cheap. The work light is nice because usually models come with an extension cord that's already built in and a hook for hanging it on a rope, as you can see there on the left. Um, the clamp light can be mounted on almost anything, uh, like my stepladder in a previous photo. So those are just, you know, you get a bulb pretty cheap, you can get this thing pretty cheap, you plug it in with a sheet and you're, you're pretty much ready to go. 
Um, but if you don't want to have a sheet in your yard or buy an extra light fixture, perhaps you have a porch or a garage light that accepts a standard light bulb. You can easily just switch out your normal bulb uh, on nights when you want to want to look for insects using a UV bulb or either and either take pictures on an existing surface like the side of your house or your garage door, which I do sometimes, or you can mount a sheet directly underneath those areas. Um, yeah, I just hang I just hang my sheet underneath my garage floodlight. It works really great. Um, so um, I want to introduce so Brandon, um, our organizer here, came out with me back in July um, to Kinky Sands to show my setup. So he, we made a quick video of that. Um, and so I'm going to defer, I'm going to stop sharing real quick and let him play that video for you to see. It's July 18th. Um, it's the hottest day of the year thus far. Uh, heat index reached 108 uh, today. And uh, high humidity, high temperatures bring in hopefully high amounts of, of moths and good diversity. We know at Kenki Sands there is a lot of diversity already. Um, over since 2014, we've documented over a thousand moth species here on the site. Um, and uh, tonight, we're here going to do some sheet lighting to try to find some more. Uh, it also happens to be uh, the first day of National Moth Week. So we have actually not just myself, but two other people on site at different locations doing the same thing. Um, trying to catalog and uh, capture some of that diversity that we can share. A lot, of sh a lot of moths will land on your sheet, but you'll get a lot of stuff that gets on the ground and you need something on the ground contrasting so you can see what's, what's there. So I just got a cheap painter start from Lowe's and uh, it really helps me see what's on the ground without stepping on it. Sometimes there's some really unique stuff uh, that I don't want to miss. So there are a lot of ways to, uh, to hang a moth sheet. Some people use rope between two trees. Some people uh, will just drape it over some sort of object. Um, it's naturally found. Some people create their own out of PVC. There's a lot of ways to do it. There's no wrong ways as long as you're getting out and observing moths. I found that this portable setup for me worked out really well. It's customizable. I can raise and lower it up to the whatever height if it's windy, sometimes I like it a little lower, um, a little more stable. But this is essentially a quilt display rack um, that folks uh, who are doing quilting, uh, they want to, you know, they're at some sort of uh, gathering, they want to hang their quilt up here. It can support a heavy, <coughs> a heavy quilt. Um, it can hang my sheet. So I also, because it could be windy later on, um, I also have these 15-pound dumbbells that I sort of uh, anchor anchor the, the legs with. So I've got just a basic cotton sheet. Everybody asked me, do you need a special sheet? No, you don't. I bought this off of Amazon. I bought one off of at Meyer. You know, I spend the least amount of uh, money I can on it. You know, less than $20 for a sheet, $10 if I'm lucky. Um, yeah, and uh, so you don't need a sheet. I just generally just get a cotton sheet. Um, I found that I I get overwhelmed uh, by the size of the sheet if it's anything larger than a twin, queen and king. I had a queen and sheet and I, I found myself just, uh, that was just too big for what I was trying to do. So, um, one thing you want your sheet to be nice and tight, uh, not so many wrinkles. So I add a lot of these clips that I got at the hardware store. Um, it makes for a cleaner picture, easier to identify the moth. You know, on a good night, I'll be out from whatever sunset is. You know, tonight it's a little after 8 o'clock, maybe till 1 in the morning, and then I'll go home. Um, that's, a, that's a good night for me. Some people will sleep in their cars and, ch you know, wake up and check it periodically um, every half hour or so or every hour because um, they know that they're going to miss moths um, that are going to come out early in the morning if they're not there. Okay, well, next... Um, what I've got here is just a normal, it's a, a cheap camera tripod that um, it's got a trigger uh, trigger head on it, a little, little ball head that I can uh, adjust the angle of my light a little bit if I'd like. It's got a, a wire mount that I bought from BioQuip, which sells entomology supplies, specifically a lot of stuff for mothing. 
and that's also where I got this uh, this bulb and head. Uh, what I'm using tonight is a 250 watt, uh, no, I like 275 watt mercury vapor bulb, uh, self ballasted. Just got it mounted. Um, the moths will be attracted to this light. They will essentially get confused a little bit by that light. Um, they'll be drawn into it and they will land on my sheet and I will photograph them. And that's that's as simple as it is. Anyway, I will um, fire up my generator, get the light on, and uh, hopefully uh, as the sun continues to go down here, we will start to pick up some species. I'm sure there's some flying right now, but as it gets darker and darker, you know, that's the best. We've got bats flying over us, so hopefully uh, <laughs> we're not competing. Uh, they're gonna be happy if they're gonna be hanging around our light. That's for sure. All right, here we go. Yeah, that's that. Now the waiting game begins. I might set up the black light behind on the other side. You know, you set one light up here. This side certainly will get most of the attention because the, the, you know, the bright light is here. There will be moths on the back side, but I like to put my black light on the back side also to attract moths that may not be um, quite getting the mercury vapor like I'd like. Just give me a better option. So we got a lot of caddisflies, we got a lot of beetles, we got a lot of leaf hoppers right now. We do have several different small moth species that we'll try to document. You know, the sheet is set up here and that's what makes it easy, but it's also good to take a headlamp, um, which I always try to carry with me and do check a perimeter of around 10 feet or so on some of the vegetation. A lot of moths won't make it to the sheet, but they will make it to some of the outer vegetation. And I find that if you don't check that, you're gonna be missing a lot of uh, potential moths. Um, so it's good to just take a lap every once in a while. A lot sometimes there's moths that get right on here. Like this one here. Got it. Thank you, Brandon. That, uh, yeah, <laughs> that was fun. That was a fun night. All right. So, but Trevor, while sheet lighting does look simple, I'm now I'm happy that you find it interesting. Why should I care about insects at night? And notice, note in that video, I talk a lot about moths, but there are a lot of other different types of insects um, that, that you can actually um, observe too. Well, if you haven't heard, insects are facing a lot of threats across the board. This new paper published by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by David Wagner et al. illustrates this well. Threats to insects are coming in from all sides. Name a current ecological problem and insects are likely to be effective neg affected negatively. We should care a lot about that because as a group, they influence so much about our lives and the ecosystem we spend so much time protecting. Here's a couple other quotes, um, but from back in 2018, uh, the, there was a, a big article in the New York Times called The Insect Apocalypse is Here. Um, and David Wagner is quoted here, um, by saying um, that when, when entomologists began noticing and investigating some of the insect declines, they lamented the absence of solid information from the past in which to ground their experiences of the present. We see a hundred of something and we think, you know, we're fine, Wagner says, but what if there were a hundred thousand of those same insects two generations ago? We don't have the data to back that up. In the United States, scientists recently found the population of monarch butterflies fell by 90%. In the last 20 years, a loss of 900 million individuals and the rusty patch bumblebee, which gets a lot of attention, um, which once lived in 28 states, is dropped by almost 90 percent over the same period with with other less studied insect species like some of these moths and others that are showing up at the sheet. Um, one butterfly researcher told me all we can do is wave our arms and say it's not here anymore. 
But Trevor, there is a lot of insect conservation going on. Yes, and I think you'll hear some of that uh, later in the Wild Things uh, conference. But it's often not enough. And often also insect conservation is focused on one individual species. And that can drive a mentality if that if your site does not have a documented, uh, threatened or an endangered species, then you don't really have to consider insects all that much in your stewardship. As we've seen from, from the monarch butterfly um, and others um, who we track really well, uh, it is hard to get on the endangered species list. Many of these insects, we have no idea about their population strength, viability, or their true distributions. So for some reasons to start caring more about insects, consider some of the benefits they provide. Pollination is one benefit that most people do associate with insects, but there's so much information left to understand about which insects pollinate what plants, and as insects fade away without much notice, so do those vital pieces of ecology that we've yet to discover. Decomposition is another one. Have you ever come across a dead animal that has been there for a day or two? Have you looked at it very closely? Likely, you're going to find a whole ecosystem of insects that most people overlook. Like this hairy rove beetle on the left that I found at Kinky Sands, or this pustulated carrion beetle that came to my sheet at Kinky River State Park. If you look closely uh, on, the, on the, the right one, um, you'll see there's these little mites uh, near its neck and on its back. Um, these mites have a really interesting relationship with this beetle as they travel, they sort of hitchhike from carcass to carcass where they will then uh, eat, eat the maggots of some of the flies and, and other insects that are there. Um, nature's pretty amazing. <laughs> here, here are some other interesting beetles that I have found while sheet lighting. Sometimes you're not really sure what it is, but it looks pretty cool. This one feeds on cottonwoods, as you might expect, but also willows and aspen on occasion. This one, this one feeds on many different types of species. Uh, one bug guide fact that I, fact that I was looking up um, said that it is notorious from emerging from woodcut furniture after as many as 10 to 40 years. This, uh, the fiery searcher beetle, a colorful and fast moving ground uh, beetle that has an additional common name called the caterpillar hunter. I saw this at the Kinky River State Park. It was constantly moving. It was very hard to get a picture. Um, but yeah, look at the color on that. And it's a fairly large beetle as well. The marbled fungus weevil. I, uh, apparently it's uh, attracted to fungus and my light setup. I love the camouflage sort of pattern on this one. A lot of these insects have really great camouflage and they're hard to, hard to find. Back to some bit more benefits. Um, pest control. Many of our native insects can help fight against some of those other exotic or invasive insects, but also they do a great job at keeping each other, each other in check when the system is in good balance. Um, as far as the food chain goes, insects are a staple food for many other animals that we all cherish. Bird migration is probably the best example. Birds migrate north and feed on thousands of caterpillars um, and other insects as a rich protein source uh, to raise their offspring. It's not a coincidence that bird numbers are down when insect numbers are also down and facing many threats. They go together. And lastly, there are so many new species and new natural histories being written and described all the time. Nature is so complex that one must assume that we know only a small percent of the benefits insects truly provide to us and the environment as a whole. So which is why I believe we should all have sheet lighting as a hobby going forward, because interest leads to tracking, which leads to awareness, which leads to concern, which then leads to action. That quote is a favorite of mine uh, for anything nature related, um, but it comes from Chris Thomas, an insect ecologist at the University of York, uh, who is quoted in that New York Times article, The Insect Apocalypse is Here. The context is, and I've been learning more about this, is that Europe has a some really long-standing insect monitoring programs, and they are better able to track some of those declines than we do here in the United States. I think we should change that uh, through some community science efforts. With all the community science tools, 
uh, like iNaturalist, Bug Guide, uh, and Moth Photographers Group, um, as well as social media groups to help with uh, IDs, IDs and questions. And I feel like there's really not a better time in history to start learning exit. Uh, insects. We have so many, so much access now than we ever did before to information, to pictures, to experts. Um, it's really incredible. So, as I mentioned in the video, I like moths a lot, um, and so you're going to see a lot of pictures of moths. Um, so let's 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 talk about that for a second. Um, I like all the insects, but yeah, moths sort of drew me in and to to sheet lighting, and just based on my lack of awareness of of how many there were, the diversity and the nature of moths um, is incredible. Conservatively, in Illinois, for every one butterfly species, there are about 20 moth species. So think about that. Um, some are day flying, but most of those moths are indeed nocturnal. Moth Photographers Group lists 2,170 moth species for the state of Illinois, but that true number is probably much higher. I wouldn't, it probably is closer to 3,000 or more. So what do moths look like to you? Take a few seconds and picture a moth in your head. Something that you had an encounter with, maybe as a kid, something you've seen recently. Uh, what does that moth look like? What color is it? What shape is it? How big is it? For many people, a little boring brown moth or something from your closet or pantry is what you might have pictured. Green clover worm moths often come out in droves around my neighborhood and are hard to ignore. Everybody's always complaining about this moth at a certain time of year. Or, if you are lucky, uh, you picture a large moth like this Luna, which is very colorful and, and hard to really miss due to its size, but it does blend in uh, with, with leaves as well. Um, the Luna moth may be my actual first memory as a kid in grade school. I remember we had a pair of them on the side of our house near my mom's clematis bush. If only I would have started sheet lighting back then. Um, all right, so now we're going to start looking at some moths. Um, just to prove to you some of the diversity and some of the incredible things you are going, you can see for sheet lighting. Sometimes they are so well camouflaged that I can't blame anyone for not actually seeing them. Watch your step around the sheet. Look at that. I think that was at Indian Ridge Marsh, actually. Um, bent winged owlet moth yeah that one i mean i, th I think i was walking uh, around and i happened to see that thing fly up and the only reason i found it was because i saw it land i, I don't know how you would you would come across that um honestly so sometimes they hide their colors from us too or sometimes they try to pretend they are bird poop. There are several moths that, that mimic bird poop. Uh, like here's another one. Um, can you see the owl eyes? This is a species I saw in my friend's backyard and and that was the only time I've ever actually seen it. It, uh, I have, it hasn't showed up on my sheet since then. It actually landed on my tripod in this picture so that's why it's not it doesn't have the, the sheet uh, uh, background to it. But look at that, look at those eyes. <clears throat> if you like color, others are not so shy. Uh, there are actually two species of crocus geometers that you can't really tell apart just by looking at them. Um, you would have to get some DNA um, to officially know which one it was. This one was at the Kanky River State Park. Gorgeous moth. All right, I admit this one was from Ohio. Um, there are sightings in Illinois, but actually how many of us are actually looking for it? I really hope to one day encounter this uh, in Illinois uh, or Northern Indiana. Uh, but yeah, who, you can't not like the rosy maple moth. It looks like uh, some cotton candy. Dragon or moth? Small-eyed sphinx moth, to be exact. Uh, I start seeing these in April. This is one of the, the more common sphinx moths in our area. It's just gorgeous. Just, I mean, uh, I've, had, I've had it like almost every location I've, I've moth, this, this moth shows up. 
before we take up take it up a notch with more, even more moth, um, let's look at a few best practices for sheet lighting. Some of these I covered in the video, but I want to go over them again so that you know. Insect activity at night can be highly variable, so not every night is created equal. For example, when you set up your light, you really want it to be dark out, so your light is all the insects really see, which means you should pick locations where you are furthest away from other light sources. But also consider the moon cycle. A full moon is competition for you, and you may want to pick a cloudy day uh, or something where the moon isn't so visible. Um, many insects won't make it to your sheet, so be sure to put out some sort of fabric on the ground so that you can easily see any contrasting um, or crawling insect. On that same note, as I mentioned in the video, be sure to take a break from your sheet and walk around the perimeter, uh, checking some nearby vegetation. I can't tell you how many times um, interesting species were hanging out on the outskirts. As a bonus, their pictures, when you take them, have great natural backgrounds. So it's, it's, it's always worth taking a, taking a lap. Which leads me to point number three. Um, as I did in the video, have a headlamp or a flashlight handy. They are great for focusing. Uh, get your, it's hard to focus sometimes with your camera without a good light source. Um, so you can put that sort of spotlight something. Um, but just or just give yourself a little bit of extra light and the flash isn't cutting it for you. Um, but also explore dark corners of your setup for new species like that it's on those vegetation. Lastly, um, in my experience, weather is a big predictor of a good night. If it is windy, I probably wouldn't waste too much of my time setting up my sheet. Um, however, we did have a really great night at the Morton Arboretum in a rainstorm where we were under a gazebo. Um, so we we're out of the rain, but it was still pretty windy outside. Um, I, but the humidity was high that night. I tend to choose nights that are calm, high humidity, and temps that are at or above 60 degrees until midnight. A string of warm days before is usually better too, especially if you're coming out of a cold snap. You know, it takes a couple couple days for the insects to become pretty active. Um, but for moths in particular, it's no coincidence that the peak season for diversity is June, July, and August, <clears throat> when it's the warmest and the most humid. I will also start mothering. I will I will usually start mothing a little earlier in, in March and go until November if the conditions uh, are right. Uh, it's also good to note here that I rarely do sheet lighting on back-to-back -back nights in the same location. Insects have very short lifespans. And for the sake of conservation, it is good to let them go about their business so populations can continue. You also don't want to make a buffet for predators like those bats uh, that were above our, our, uh, our sheet light. Um, you know, and if you leave your sheet out overnight, um, you know, birds will find, will find it in the morning and, you know, the insects are sort of just sitting there. So let's get back to some, some crazy moths. We're going we're gonna to turn it up, turn it up a notch here. I told you. Some people call this the Easter bunny moth. Um, I also saw this one in Ohio, but it can be found in our area. Just, just look at that. Don't you just want to pet it? Oh, I love that one. I, just the shape of that. That's not a traditional, it's not a shape that you would expect. Do you have a latte this morning? Because that's what this moth reminds me of. This one was out in uh, eastern Kankakee County in the Sands. Um, yeah, I've never seen anything like it. I love the detail on this one. Often comes to my porch light and my, my friend, friend's porch light as well in the Kankakee area. Plume moths all are a special category. They all have this sort of T-like shape. Um, they're usually pretty small, but as you can see, they are fairly complex. Uh, most people would probably not think this is a moth right off the bat, but it definitely is. Oh, here's a good story. I got so crazy into moths over the last three years, apparently. Um, a friend who I've never met in person messaged me on social media about a moth he had seen at the Kankakee Walmart by the mulch bags. So I marched on over there. <clears throat> and found this awesome imperial moth between pallets of miracle grow. That was a fun day. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> I probably looked, looked really strange uh, digging for that, trying to find that moth in the, in the racks outside in the garden center. 
but it was worth it. <laughs> this is an incredible moth right here. We should just end the slideshow on this species, I think. Um, I have only seen it twice. You remember that author, John Himmelman, who I quoted earlier um, from his Discovering Moths book. I became Facebook friends with him, and after I posted this, he said that he had only seen it once in 20 years of mothing on the East Coast. So I really cherish this picture. I, I've been able to see this moth twice, uh, once in Illinois and once in Ohio. The caterpillar is in, incredible. Uh, each each instar of the caterpillar, the, they save the like ex parts of the exoskeleton, you know, the the shed of it, and sort of create this like oh, medieval looking uh, device that they can swing at predators. It's incredible. Uh, please look up this cat this, the caterpillar of this. Probably the largest moth I've ever seen um, in Ohio and Mothapalooza, which uh, Mothapalooza exists. It did exist. Um, they haven't done it. I don't think they're going to continue doing it, um, but it was exciting to be there. Um, can you see the tops, top of the wings? Um, does it look like a snakehead to you? These are mostly east and south of us where their host plant is more common, but incredible. Just another boring moth, cherry scallop shell moth. This one I can hardly ever get to land on uh, my sheet, but it will come nearby. It'll land on like nearby vegetation, or in one case, uh, it was on a, a, the hood of a car that was sort of near the sheet lighting um, setup that, that was going on. There was another time where it sort of tucked itself under the roof of a pavilion. That's, that's another tip if you're looking for moths in the morning before sunrise. Um, or, or during, you know, in the morning hours, go go to like your park pavilion, look up and under the rafters. There are oftentimes incredible moths just tucked up in there, wait because they, you know, they essentially it's like a, a tree to them, so they're hiding in there, waiting for night. But look at that, nature is crazy. Nothing to see here, just another another boring moth. Um, this one is is a common one at the Kanky River State Park. Caterpillar for this is really large and, and, and really impressive. All right, before I show the last handful of my sheet lighting discoveries, I wanted to alert you to another fun alternative to sheet lighting for your backyard and stewardship site, a technique called sugar baiting. You can see some of the ingredients people use here. The idea is that you make a concoction uh, with a consistency of a thick paste, then you put it in a container and let it just get nice and fermenty. I usually let mine um, sit and stew for a couple days, usually in a mildly warm spot. Uh, if you use a lid like I did here, you're going to have to let it breathe and open it every once in a while so it doesn't build up too much gas in there. Um, but yeah, they, they really, uh, there's a certain, certain group of insects that, uh, that really prefer this. Um, once you're ready with it, make sure you, you just paint it on a tree or an old fence post or some boards that you may have laying around. Moths and beetles are attracted to it at night. I often do this in conjunction with my light setup because there are some species that seem to prefer it. I find it particularly effective early in the season or, or later in the season um, when there's less sort of floral activity around. It's easy to do at home. Another similar method is wine roping um, where you sort of boil some sugar, you know, sort of um, bring wine up to a uh, higher temperature and you add, you stir in sugar, make it really, really sweet and a little bit thicker. <clears throat> and then you soak rope in there and then you hang the rope over uh, a branch or so and it'll sort of do the same effect <clears throat> uh, Yes um, This is a moth that shows up late or early in the season and is attracted to sugar baiting um, <clears throat> this particular moth um, <clears throat> Yeah, is feeding on um, a sugar baiting uh, trail that uh, was created at Kanky Sands uh, where we painted on a trees. Uh, this was early in the spring, I believe April, um, that this showed up, and it's it's uh, sipping on some of that sap. I assume that many of these moths will also feed on sap running naturally from trees as well, so that'd be a good place to look. <clears throat> so, this moth amazed me. This moth, uh, I saw in my backyard. My backyard is nothing special. I have, if you look out in my yard, there are like five or six houses that surround my small yard. There's, it's, the neighborhood is filled with silver maples. It's not like some sort of natural paradise um, out there. But this moth showed up, and it, it really blew me away. Um, and yes, <clears throat> and yes, that's my wedding ring for scale. 
So what I want to prove here is that, you know, there's some really beautiful big moths, but some of these really tiny moths that are just millimeters are also very intricate. Um, and so let's, uh, let's take a look at that. The chinkapin leaf miner moth. Last I checked, just a handful of observations on iNaturalist for this species in the Midwest. I saw mine on April 23rd, 2019 in my backyard in Kankakee County, and I've never seen another one since. <laughs> Man, always on the lookout. I check every little thing now. I remember, I just remember the feeling of awe I had looking at it. And now, I, yeah, like I said, I inspect every little thing. I couldn't even really get a whole visual of it until I, um, until I zoomed in on my, on my camera uh, to see, see that intricacy and that, those colors. It's amazing. Uh, here's a, speaking of rare moss, here's another one I encountered on my sheet with the Morton Arboretum stewards. This species is listed as imperiled in the Nature Serve database. In fact, we didn't know for months what it was until a graduate student at Cornell University reached out to us on iNaturalist and to tell us the name of the species. It certainly wasn't any guidebooks that I had. There are two observations of this species on iNaturalist, both from that same night at Morton on August 15th. Recently, the natural Michigan Natural Features Inventory asked me to use my picture for their database because no one had actually seen it recently alive to photograph it. All they had were pin specimens. It has a unique life history that is tied to our area um, to prairie drop seed. The caterpillars feed on the ripening seed heads of prairie drop seed. And the adult moth doesn't really fly too far away from its host, which means in most cases, it's a prairie remnant dependent species. There are, there are many more unique insects to discover out there in our neck of the woods. So moths are not alone on the sheet. I showed you a handful of beetles earlier. And it should be noted that you certainly will see a wide array of other insect groups as well. This one flew to my sheet in Kankakee County. I was able to coax it on a stick for, photog for this photography. Sometimes if the insects are calm, I will try to do that. But I always make sure I take a picture first while it's on the sheet in case it flies away. Leaf hoppers are another amazing group of insects that deserve more of our attention. I have had several species come to my light. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I love the stained glass look of a uh, lacewing species. There are several in our area. Here's a good one that I got on the sheet of a brown lacewing. Here's another of a green lacewing. Yeah, there's also an incredible uh, diversity of wasps out there. Uh, lucky for us, uh, in 2021, um, if you're interested in sheet lighting, there are two brand new uh, guidebooks to wasps coming out. Uh, I have one in-house already, and then I have another one that I ordered that should be here in the next week or so. So I'm, I'm excited to start identifying these uh, in a more consistent way. <laughs> This this one originally freaked me out when it came to my sheet. I had never seen any wasp that looked like this, um, but it turns out that the thread extension is not quite a, is not a stinger, but actually a drill that is used to deposit eggs in the side of trees. Pretty incredible. Um, I got a little braver, um, <clears throat> so I could add some scale. It's great moths and insects like those that I miss, but. Um, but it's really moments like these that I, I miss the most. Um, sharing nature with people in a meaningful way, a social uh, way, is, is exciting. I, I only really knew a handful of these folks uh, who came out to the Kanky River State Park one night, but we had a really great time. Same with this night at Indian Ridge Marsh in Chicago. I want to challenge you. As I finish up here, I want to challenge you as stewardship leaders and outreach professionals to incorporate sheet lighting into your field work or engagement plans. I think we need to get more people out after dark exploring nature and viewing insect diversity in a new light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Trevor. Um, well, we wait for folks to begin to add more questions in the chat now. There were a lot of great questions that came in um, during your presentation. And um, happily, we have we have about um, 12 minutes left of the session to take some, to dive into some questions. So let's start with this one. Um, how many insect and arachnid species do you think you've photographed? 
Oh, um, in those three years, I, I'd have to, I certainly have over, I don't know if I quite have a thousand, but it's certainly uh, getting close to that. Um, you know, Ma, Lepidopter alone, I think I'm, you know, like almost 500. So, um, yeah. Excellent. Um, we had a series of questions sort of about some of the mechanics of doing sheet lighting. Sure. Um, and there were some questions about, you know, for folks who don't have generators, are there any other power solutions for <laughs> out in a natural area? Yeah, so good question. Um, and so in that case, um, I do have another, uh, you can use a car battery um, with a sort of a converter to power a, a black light. Um, BioQuip sells a separate um, battery that you can sort of convert um, that. Um, there are, there's a new LED, uh, sort of low power LED moth light that people are using like, um, like charging banks to plug into like through USB. Um, yeah, I think I would, you know, the generator, it just allows me to power a more, you know, have a more robust uh, mercury vapor bulb. Uh, a lot of, if you're close to a power source and you want to run a long extension cord, you know, from your house, if you have an outdoor outlet, um, you can, you can, you don't have to use a generator, but I would, I would look into um, sort of getting a black light, a low powered black light um, with a battery set up. And I think you, uh, you'd be satisfied with that. It's also less noisy. Yeah. Um, we had a question about, you know, sort of, of thinking about conservation and is there concern about the insects landing on the sheet because they're exhausted from flying or orienting around the light? Um, you know, and the person who asked this brought it up because um, they'd heard elsewhere that that can be a concern. Um, and so do you have any thoughts on that and whether, you know, there's any negative impacts on the moths and other insects from having this experience? Well, as I, as I, I mentioned there at the tips, uh, the, at the, for the tips of sheep lighting, um, I definitely don't like to do, for those, some of those factors, I don't like to do sheet lighting in the same place um, consistently, back-to-back um, -back nights or even the same week, because, you know, they need to leave, they need to go about their business, they have short lifespans, um, you know, they're, when they're resting on the sheet, you know, um, it's it's very similar to them resting on you know a vegetation or or um, you know some some trees. Um, they're certainly and that's why I put the I put the the sheet on the ground as well, so I, I can avoid stepping on on things. Um, so that's a consideration. I don't collect any any of the insects. Um, I just photograph them, so I'm not removing any of them. Um, but yeah, I, I think responsibly cautious is is what everyone should do um, when doing sheet lighting. Excellent. Um, just to, to absolutely clarify, we had a couple of questions about this, about whether the moths or insects are trapped on the sheet or if they can move about freely and and do they survive the, the process of, you know, being on the sheet and being photographed? Yeah, as soon, so they're not trapped on the sheet. They um, I don't like I don't have any special sheet, but there are often times where one insect will land and I'll go to photograph it and it'll fly away. It gets, and then maybe it'll come back. Maybe it'll fly into the darkness. Um, you know, uh, so I, I've missed a lot of great insects, no doubt about it, um, for, because they've been able to fly away. It's not, they're not stuck there in any, any way. Um, and uh, what was the second part? Um, do they survive the process? Yeah. So as soon as I shut off the light, they all scatter. So I mean, I, I take down my. Um, as soon as I shut it off, they're they're on to the next thing. Um, I sort of shake out the sheet, get any stragglers off of there. Um, so you know, the, the the light just holds them in that place just for and while I'm documenting them, and then when I'm done, they're free to go about their their normal cycle. That's why I, you know it. Like I said it sort of being conservative about when you do it and how often you do it, I think is, is a good practice. Excellent. Do you ever put sugar bait on the sheet? I have not done that. Usually I will put sugar, I'll, I'll like set my sheet up and then I'll go somewhere sort of where it's darker, where their insects are not necessarily influenced by my light so much, maybe, you know, 50 yards away and I'll paint on, on trees or, um, 
some sort of if I bring some logs with me um, or find some logs local, I'll uh, I'll paint it there. Um, yeah, I try to keep those things separate, but I suppose you could you could do it um, right against your sheet if you wanted a nice compact uh, space. Excellent. Um, and just a quick station break. We have somebody about how asking how long is the session on sheet lighting. We'll be wrapping up in about six minutes at nine thirty. The session will end at nine thirty. Um, a question. One more question about sort of concern for for the moths themselves um, and and bulbs. Um, we have a question. I've heard you should use a yellow light bulb for normal outdoor lighting to avoid nighttime insect fight fatality from flying around bulbs to exhaustion. And I think I think Mary in asking this is is asking sort of like generally for outdoor light lighting. Um, is that true? Do you have any sense of that? Uh, I have seen those bulbs for sale. Um, I assume they manipulate the wavelength a little bit. Um, the best thing you can do um, if, is to get a motion detect light so that the light is on when you need it, but then it goes off immediately and um, and it doesn't disrupt anything. A light that is constantly left on all night, you know, light pollution, it's a big problem. Uh, I wish everyone would just convert to a motion detect uh, light. And I think um, that would be less of a concern. We have one more question about process, and there's so much enthusiasm. Trevor, we'll share the chat with you afterward. But people, like so many people, are are inspired to do this in their neighborhood this summer. Um, you really have a lot. You really got have a lot of converts to sheet lighting this morning. Good. That was um, the goal. Excellent. But um, one one final question about process: Will a car battery power a 120 volt black light? Um. I think so. I use a car battery for my black light. Um, I, though I don't think I have um, that high of a watt. I think mine's only 20 watt uh, bulb. So you'd have to, I'd have to know a little bit more about that. And um, yeah, at least temporarily it should. I don't know how long it would go. I um, want to move into some questions we have about IDs. Um, what resources do you use to identify your moth photo to identify your moth photos? Well, there are a handful of really good books out there. Um, I don't have the current one handy for some reason, but uh, Peterson Field Guide to uh, the Moths. Uh, there's one of Eastern uh, Northeastern uh, the United States. Highly recommend picking that up. Um, that has about 600 or so species in it, which is incredible since Illinois has you know over 2,000 um, species. Uh, here's another good book, The Moths and Caterpillars of the North Woods. You know, this is gonna be a lot of your standard common moths. Some of the big showy ones are in here. Um, Illinois has a good uh, field guide to the silk moths of Illinois, which you can pick up for like a ridiculous like $3 from the Illinois Natural History Survey. It's an older book, but it's great. It has great color photos in it, um, and it is Illinois specific. Um, um, I, but, but other than that, uh, a handful of those books, um, the internet is, 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 is wild. And iNaturalist, which you'll hear other people talk about, has a great database you can sort through. I use that. I post a lot there. A lot of other authors post there. And so you can sort of see what's been seen in your area already. Um, the Moth Photographers Group out of, um, Mississippi State University has lists for each state. Um, and pictures you can click on. Usually they're pin specimens. Um, uh, there is, um, let's see, um, the but Butterflies and Moths of North America uh, website, which also has uh, distribution and photo uh, information. Uh, Bug Guide is also great. I usually use Bug Guide quite a bit if I want to. If I want to learn more about the natural history of the moth itself. Um, there's usually uh, literature and what food they they're known to eat. Um, sometimes there's there's a lot that's unknown. We don't even know the host plant for many of these species. So um, it's sort of that fun mystery. Um, so those are bug guide, iNaturalist, uh, moth photographers group. That's where I'd point you first. And then we have a, we had a couple of questions as we as we run a little bit short of time right now. But we had a couple of questions about about the photography. Do you have any tips about cameras or flashes 
um, look for people who are thinking about you know, looking to try mothing for the first time. And then also any particular settings for smartphones for folks who don't have an investment in, you know, fancier cameras. Well, I mean, smartphones are getting really great. And I think that's smartphone. I think the idea is there you want the headlamp or some sort of flashlight, some sort of some sort of external light that you can highlight um, the moth um, or whatever you're trying to photograph and then take the picture with your phone sort of separately, like a two handed thing there. Um, I've seen a lot of people get good, great pictures um, at my events doing that. Um, for me, I use a DSLR for now um, and a designated macro lens. I have the Tamron 90 macro lens, which is a great one. Um, and then um, for, I think the best thing that I've learned about my pictures is diffusion of light with the flash because you got the light from the light bulb coming then you have your light um, From the flash so you want to make sure your flash is nice and diffused and that you have your white balance set you know, nicely Because um, the the background of the sheet can get really blow out things quite a bit um, So you gotta be careful with that. I, I usually I, I take periodic pictures just of the sheet itself and adjust my settings before I see an insect I want to photograph. Um, I think you also want to have your f stop, so your depth of field at like f. I usually use f11 or f13, so that some of these insects are pretty small, so you want a little bit wider range there. Um, but yeah, I, I think that those would be sort of my my tips.